Okay, so I hope that works. So how was the long weekend? That's basically me right now. I will say I didn't have class on Monday. <laughs> yeah, but Labor Day just started. Really? Yeah. It's just that Monday so happens to be the only day I don't have class. Are you going to start at some point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All three months I've been cooped up in my own house. Yeah. You have that one night where you just go and go to sleep, and when you finally do, it's like one, one yak food. Yeah. Don't they, weren't you going to bring um, the USB C? It's okay, I brought it just in case. <laughs> you can try that next time. Yeah, I'll, I'll write it down. Okay. All right, let's see. So, um, let's see the forum. Your two contributions are due on Thursday. Only two people have contributed. It might take you like not a trivial amount of time. Some reading and you have to write some stuff, so don't don't let it until the last half an hour. Allow yourself a little bit of time. Okay, so the one that is due, not this week, but the next week, is up. Um, it's about um, the paper on how these authors evolve using a genetic algorithm, a series of uh, stellar models to then compare we uh, observations of white dwarfs is because they want to know what is the amount of helium or the thickness of the helium layer in the in the white dwarf and also what is the composition of the white dwarf, dwarf so the oxygen versus carbon and so they do that with a uh, genetic algorithm so that's related to what we're seeing today. I have not updated the uh, research meeting project, but I know what I'm going to um, sign. It's going to be problem uh, 10.27 in um, Carol and what's the name of the other dude? Oh, the orange group. Yes. Hmm? Second? I think it's from 2017. I have. I Yeah. Okay. 
I, I didn't bring the book, but um, I, I will, you know, I think there's three editions. Yeah. And I think like two are the second edition. There are like two second editions. Uh, there's like an international one. So, you know, I'll check that. Yes, I, I will. I mean, in principle, you do not need to code. But yeah, I, I think it helps. Uh, but everything that you need is in my notes. Um, yeah, I don't think, you know, it helps because it's one of the books. Yeah. I mean, I like it when I see the footnotes in the Yeah. Um, okay, so, so it's going to do uh, this assignment that I have in mind. Um, the authors of the book actually have a website, like a companion website, and you can download code um, and images and other things. And so the, they have a stellar structure, code, which they say is not um, research. Edition, it's, it's more educational, uh, but you can play with the parameters. So you know the um, density as a function of radius, uh, temperature as a function of radius, all these things, and then you can create your own models. So I think that's nice because you don't have to write the code, but you still have to play around with it. So um, I will update that when I get home. Um, so homework two. Uh, homework two is due today, uh, is tonight. Any questions about it? Okay, can you remind me what it is? Yes. Um, and the I, I assigned them? Yeah. Wait, is that what I wrote on the problem? Okay, so what is the question about it? Uh, I'm just trying to mm. I'll send an email when I get home. Okay. But, you know, essentially, um, I don't remember assigning that one. Um, You'll solve that one the same way that um, we calculated the luminosity last time with the uh, random one. So it's the same idea. You have a um, mean free path that you can calculate, and then you just have to, um, I guess, see the relationship with the square root of the number of steps. And the length of each step is the number of steps. Okay, so I kind of mentioned this last time. If the chemical composition is fixed and uniform, so let's say that you have all these stars you know, that are forming from the same gas, same amount of metals, and same amount of um, ratio of hydrogen and helium, then um,
pressure, which is a function of R, kappa, which is a function of R, and epsilon, which is a function of R, are going to be fixed functions. So they are functions of the radius, but they're going to be completely determined by uh, mass and the composition. So in reality, these three are functions of rho and temperature. So you can uh, reduce them these two. And the structure of a star is going to be given by its mass function, luminosity, density. And temperature. So this mass, you know, is whatever you have contained um, inside inside the sphere. So if you want to know the if this is R, you know, your star might continue further away. Is what you already have inside. Um, the luminosity is going to be at that particular radius. The density is also at that particular radius, and temperature is um, that particular radius. So you have a, a gradient uh, with each of these quantities. So the luminosity, just to remind you, is the radiant energy per second flowing through the area of the sphere. So it's an energy density per second. All of them are related. PM, which is the concentration of mass. conservation of energy. Hey, Dr. Munoz. Yes. Could you make um the the P for pressure and the rho for density a little more distinct? It's a little confusing to follow. The rho and the P? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so usually my P has a thing yet over here. <laughs> And the row is just like that. Um, let me see, maybe I can move it a little closer. You know, we have written these a few times. Um, I just wanted to show something. We have DT. Three kappa function of R rho function of R L function of R okay. 
So this one comes from hydrostatic equilibrium. This one is conservation of mass, this one is conservation of energy, and this one is the thermodynamics. So they have different origin. Um, I guess if you are used to separating different fields of physics. Um, and they come together to, uh, to tell you how the, the star is going to behave. So you also have these boundary conditions. The mass at zero is equal to rho. No, sorry, luminosity at zero. Zero. And the pressure at R is equal to the temperature at R, which is equal to zero. So there is something weird over here. This is this is completely correct, and I would derive it from uh, from the physics. These boundary conditions, there's something that doesn't make much sense. Which one is it? The temperature. Why? So this is saying that the temperature at the surface of the star is zero. Is that what we observe? No, stars seem to be pretty hot. So what is the what is the problem there? Did we make an approximation that is not holding? Yes. Maybe because you have um renormal. No, no, say, say it. Oh, no, like, it was a mistake. Uh, I was going to say luminosity is going to be equal to zero, but no, that's wrong. So, we assume that the mean free path of the radiation and the, the photons inside of the star was um, very small much smaller, one over rho kappa, much smaller than r minus small r. So that wherever you are, the mean free path of the electron, let's say, you know, one micrometer or something, is much smaller than this distance, which can be you know, thousands of kilometers. But there's a place where this doesn't hold anymore. So the approximation becomes weaker and weaker. Where does this happen? Hmm? Close to the surface. Why is that? We're going to be comparable, right? Like this will be close to zero. This will also be um, it's not going to be you know, many orders of magnitude smaller. So what's going to happen at the surface of the star? So everything is very compact and is very well described by these equations. Not to most of the radius, but at the end, the density is kind of not going to follow the same trend anymore. Um, so the mean free path is going to change. And so you're going to have something like an atmosphere. So this will be the realm of the, uh, the stellar at the, the atmosphere of the star, the stellar atmosphere. So you know, it's, it's pretty dense. Then at some point, um, it doesn't go completely to zero. Um, 
it's just diffuse. So we're going to make, um, we're going to define an effective radius. And we're going to explain what that is. So the density of rho over rho at the center, so this is one, is going to look, if you just follow the uh, differential equations, it look like that. So this is the radius. Um, in reality, it is going to look a little bit like that. So you have very little mass, like total mass, that is um, uh, close to the surface, but still is not. It doesn't go to zero right away. So. In the case of the sun, I have three radius, three radii yeah, here. So over here, where the density actually goes to zero, is the true radius. And then Over here, where it will go to zero otherwise, you can call it um, effective radius. And in the case of the sun, really, the other star, uh, it, it's the, the photosphere. So can you, so this, you know, this area over here, is the uh, the atmosphere? Can you see the atmosphere of the sun? Let's say that you are you have some good glasses that allow you to look directly at the sun. Have you ever seen a solar eclipse? <laughs> Highly recommend it. It's I'm breathtaking. What's that? Me too. I saw the one in 2017. Uh, so when you, um, when the moon covers the sun completely, then you can see the, the corona. And you know, I observed with some uh, telescopes, and I could even see like the uh, uh, the mass ejections, and they're just like pink. You can see this glow around it. That glow is the atmosphere, but under normal conditions, you cannot see it. Why? It's too diffuse. So when you look at the sun. If you're brave enough, um, yeah, you know, um, um, when I lived in Portland, we had like horrible um, um, uh, forest fires. Like the the sun would look completely red, and we could see it. It was there was no problem. Yeah. 
So you, you can see like the shape and everything. It didn't, it didn't hurt your eyes. It was so much, I mean, it was not good for your lungs. The eyes were okay. So um, when, when you look at a star, when you look at the sun, you're actually looking at this effective radius. That's where the sun or the, sorry, the light becomes kind of free and can leave the, the, the body. Uh, everything that is underneath, it's actually opaque, cannot leave for a very long time. And what it's afterwards, or I guess what, what lies beyond this effective radius, is, uh, is too dilute to actually see. So, you know, maybe with the right instruments you can study it, but for the most part, you look into the star and it has an atmosphere that you cannot really see. So, um, for the sun, the chromosphere, transition region, corona, and heliosphere are part of the of its atmosphere. How big is the heliosphere? And what is it? So you have the the solar wind and the the solar wind uh, has essentially removed everything that doesn't belong to the solar system uh, from the solar system. So at some point you, know, you have interstellar space and you have like all kinds of radiation over there. So or you have the uh, the shock between the interstellar um, uh, environment and the solar wind, that's where you have the boundary for the heliosphere. So we lie, the planet Earth is inside of the extended atmosphere of the sun. Makes sense, somewhat protected. So, Oh, no. Both of them, yes. So, I heard that the the radiation is kind of a very fast. It is? So, if they It's not poetic. Um, so hot can be um, the energy, right? So if you have a lot of high energy radiation, even if the density is really low, um, you have like X-rays or gamma rays, they'll be hot. Um, I don't know. No, because the density is too low. Um, but you can you can measure the, the heat. Yeah. So um, you know, in, inside you, we're just protected by the solar wind. So it has a temperature or the characteristics of, of the sun. Um, outside, you know, I, I don't really know too much about it. Um, I know that. You know, the latest research suggests that we are inside of a cloud. So, have you seen like the uh, Orion Nebula? So you just see like stars and then it's like really bright. Um, so you, you can see the gas and it's because it's being um, excited by the radiation of the stars. But if you were there, you will not see the gas because it's so diffuse. So you know, we only see it because it's the aggregate for the so apparently the sun is moving through a similar region. But it's, you know, it's hard to study. Um, we only have the voyagers that actually went out. And inside, you, know, you can only do it with observations. Um, and it would be like the deviation from what you expect, you know, a certain galaxy to look like and how it actually looks like. But you know, how, how can you be completely sure that it has to look like that? 
So it's kind of kind of um, difficult to study that that region. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's hot. Yeah, the particles are really energetic. Okay, so the other quantities that we're looking at. Um, I'm going to start using this notation. R star to mean like the end of the, the true. So for a more real, you know, more realistic stars, and not just the, the model, the pressure is going to look like that. Did you just publish? That thing at the top. So this is will be the, the pressure at the center. So you know, really the pressure after about 0.5 of the true radius um, it's, it's very low. And then temperature looks a little bit more like this. So pretty low compared to the temperature of the core um, by you know, 0.75 true radius. Um, the mass, that one does look more like what you would expect. And the luminosity is a little bit like that. So the luminosity is not zero at the very center, um, as we assume with our models. But it's very small compared to the luminosity at the, um, at the surface. So I have um, some slides that I'm going to show later, on which you can see this information um, better, nicer way. So so what we're going to do is assume. There's an effective radius for a star in which the temperature here is zero or very small compared to the temperature at the core. And also uh, the pressure is uh, really low. So if you want to conserve your luminosity and you assume that you have a um, black body radiation, then that luminosity has to be sigma t to the fourth effective radius times uh, four pi effective radius squared. And remember that sigma 
is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So A is another constant. Uh, C is the speed of light. So this is 2 pi the fifth. R effective to the four. Uh, 15 H C cube. Sorry. Cube squared. And then you have the number of atoms. Your fault. And this comes from that ugly integral. Who was it? Um, this one? Okay, so we're going to define optical depth, effective optical. So it is from the effective radius to the true radius. And it is kappa. row dr. And I hope that this one looks familiar. Does it look familiar? It's in the homework. Um, so in the homework, what is this uh, tau effective? What, what did you do with it? Well, the intensity, light intensity, at a given optical depth is the original amount of uh, intensity times e to the negative tau. So it's a, it's a half life. So what did you expect? Do you expect this uh, tau effective to be large or small um, for a star? So after the effective radius and all the way to the true radius. Well, I can think about it in two ways. So this row, will be small, which will bring a lot of matter um, close to the surface. And this uh, opacity also going to be small. You have mostly just um, hydrogen, which is a pretty small atom. So the fact that the tau effective small uh, means that we can um, look at the effective surface of the star. Uh, but this one also defines you know how deep into the star you can look at. So at some point you know, this kicks in this one too and then you cannot see any deeper into the star. So these are different ways of um, understanding, I guess, what we see. We don't really see the whole extension of the star, we just see its effective surface. All right, so in practice, the Boundary conditions the 
instead of having rho at r equals zero, what we have is rho at r is much smaller than rho at zero. The same thing for the temperature. Instead of having temperature r, r equals zero, what we have is temperature at r much smaller than temperature at the core. This is true. So for the sun, the density at the core doesn't have much space. is 98 um, grams per centimeter cube. What is the density of water? Yep, one gram. So it is, you know, substantially heavier, or denser than water. Um, the density at uh, Um, are effective is five times ten to the negative seven grams per centimeter cube. So, you know, it's not quite zero, but it's pretty tiny. It's, uh, Eight orders of magnitude or something. And the temperature at the center is something comes into the six. Thirteen. Um, Kelvin. And the temperature at the effective radius is uh, 9600. So it's also pretty small. I guess four orders of magnitude smaller. So then this is the um, approximate boundary conditions. All right, so the Bob Russell theorem is not really a theorem. But it says that we have a uh, force first order differential equations that I wrote at the beginning. And then you have four boundary conditions, but the only parameter that matters in the boundary conditions is uh, the radius, r. So that implies that if the composition is unique, so you don't have different compositions, um, different places of the star, then there is only one solution uh, of that system of differential equations that um, I guess it satisfies all the conditions. So you have a unique model of the structure of the star. But there is something else that makes it a little bit more complicated. You can have different uh, parameters 
to different models, different stars, if you can go from the stars, that have the same observables, the same luminosities, the same temperatures, uh, but have different um, densities, for example. So the solutions are not unique. And that is one of the more interesting points of the second forum, in which the, the authors um, use the genetic algorithm. So there is some initial uh, analysis of this uh, white dwarf. Um, this is probably like from the 90s or something. And it didn't agree with, with stellar models. So what they do using uh, this genetic algorithm is to find a different family of solution. So they also feed you know, all the observers. So um, for a given set of parameters, you have a unique solution, but that solution, you may get the same solution with different sets of parameters. So something to keep in mind and I think that also happens, you know, kind of often in science in general. Okay, uh, so the effective temperature of a um, star is obtained by fitting um, its, its total uh, power to a block body radiation curve. I will show you a diagram of that. Okay, so let's look at another implication of these equations. So this is pressure. We mentioned before that the uh, in the upper limit of mass, so you have when, when the matter is um, uh, relativistic, and so the pressure is going to be close to pure radiation pressure. Um, that is the, the limit. If you cannot have a star that is composed only of radiation, you need some matter. That means that the pressure, you know, in general, is going to be equal to a combination of a radiation pressure and a gas pressure. You know, for different stars, depending on the mass, this ratio is going to be different. So, if your radiation pressure is zero, and all your pressure comes from gas, what would that describe? Gas giant? Jupiter, Saturn? Um, if you're in this limit, in which you only have radiation pressure, this will be a, a giant star, like or something like that. Um, stuff in between, which is almost everything, is going to be a combination of both. So the radiation pressure, now I'm self-conscious about my piece. Um, is equal to that for a black body. Um, sorry. Uh, 
And remember that ET, ER is minus three kappa rho luminosity divided by four speed of light is a constant um, t cubed, which is a function of r, uh, four pi r squared. So if you take this derivative of the radiation uh, pressure with respect to the temperature, we get four thirds a t cube. This implies that dt is dp radiation divided by the four thirds a t cube. So we can move the three over here. And we can put these over here. So this is um, three dp radiation, four a t cube. So we can get rid of these threes and this whole thing except for the C. And so the derivative of the radiation pressure with respect to the radius is minus three kappa which is a function of the radius, rho, which is a function of the radius, luminosity, which is a function of the radius, over four pi c r squared. And that is only one part of this equation. So, Remember that DPDR is um, minus G mass, which is a function of the radius, and rho, which is also a function of the radius, over R squared. Now, um, we can subtract the radiation from the total. That, um, let me keep this one. So we're going to end up with so minus radiation pressure 
minus the total, the plus. What is that relationship? So over here you have the derivative of the gas pressure with respect to the radius. So it has to be causative, this, um, this condition. So you can get rid of the R's and the rows. And we get that kappa, function of the radius times the luminosity, function of the radius is uh, less than uh, 4 pi g c um, And you can simplify it a little bit further if you just look at the effective radius. Which is essentially what you see when you look at a star. So you get Use M star for the whole mass. So I should use L star for the luminosity at the surface. So this looks pretty useful. What will you use that for? Well, you know G, you know C, you know 4 pi. What about the mass? You might infer that from uh, the effect on um, other bodies. So, and if you know the type of star, you will have an idea for what kappa is. So if you can estimate its mass, then you'll have a good idea of what its luminosity is. So you can compare that with the actual, uh, I guess the um, observed luminosity, which depends on how far away it is. So you could use that to estimate how far away a particular star is. Another cool thing is that this is not limited to stars. It also holds for uh, for galaxies. If there's very far away, we can only observe uh, you know, this point of light. Um, then you might. I mean, there's more stuff in there because um, this kappa becomes. It's more difficult to determine. Um, but in general, it's going to depend on how young or how old the stars are going to be, the stars in the, in the galaxy. So you know, this allows you to know actually, quite a bit, or estimate um, many of the quantities of the star. I guess. Um, Another potential use, if you know the luminosity, for example, if you know that um, 
but it's um, we call it a supernova explosion. And you can calculate the mass of the supernova. So that inequality is called the Eddington mean. So, if the limit is violated, then the star is going to disperse matter until um, until it reaches equilibrium. And then this will hold. And so there may be other issues with this kappa, like what I was saying before, that um, you know, if we are inside of a cloud of gas, then maybe all of our observations are of kappa are systematically wrong. Yeah, all right, so. So these are the equations from which everything arises. And this is for radiative transfer. The other one that exists is uh, convection. And we'll look at it later. Uh, but for the most part, so this is the HR diagram of human resources. You can see that you have the white bars over here. These are supposed to be real observations. You have the main sequence, which you have almost everything. And you have the giants. So they do not quite uh, follow a, a, a line. Um, you have a distribution around that. That distribution comes from different initial compositions of different stuff. But, you know, they, there seems to be some Looks like a function to me. Uh, and it's um, smooth, right? You don't have many rough edges or anything. Uh, but why do you have uh, three different like main branches? Main sequence, giants, and hydrons. So on the x-axis you have the, the temperature and is rhythmic and on the y-axis you have the luminosity. The luminosity of the sun is one, so 
and this down here. So why do you why do you have three distinct branches? So you differentiate them. No, so I think what you said is not impossible, but I think it would be unlikely that you have um, kind of the same uh, set of parameters for different um, kinds of stars. The pythons are not stars. So what you can see here is that they follow a line because they are following the differential equations. Uh, it's a little bit tacky because the initial composition is different. Um, but they are in distinct branches because they are um, fundamentally different. So in main sequence, they're burning hydrogen, and then the giants are burning helium at the core, and the polygons are just being supported by an electron emission as so the math is the same, um, but the particulars are different. And the main difference is the, uh, the composition. Like so the main sequence are going to be mostly hydrogen, and then the giants have a, a substantial portion of helium. And the blood dwarfs, they have like oxygen and carbon. So that's what you can see over here. I think so the non distinct solutions, I think you can see it more say like I start that is over here, but I want that is over here. They might have uh, the different um, let me say. So it will be the same point, right? So the same star might have a um, different distribution of the density, a different temperature distribution, um, but it looks the same because of the kappa distribution. So I think that's the right way to see it. It's the same point, uh, but they might be different because of uh, for the uh, distribution of the uh, mass. So, so you just have close up. And then, as far as the actual mass, or density, pressure, and temperature for the sun. And Rs is the accepted radius of the sun. So here the mass is pretty much what you expect. The density, actually you have very little density after 3.5 This is where the mass symmetry is like what it is. And then the pressure is you know, negligible at like you know, 145 also. But the temperature, maybe if you just follow this, this line, it will end up like over here. Where the effective radius will be like 0.8. But you still have. Um, material and hence energy uh, after that will, I think, stop stalling. 
So if you just put these uh, functions into your differential equations, uh, they will probably not have work. That means that approximation. Then this is the, the feet. So I mentioned before that the sun is really close, but not quite a black body. And not a black body, if it is emitting any light. Um, but here you can see that um, it's pretty close. So it emits less than what people expect from a black body at the shortest wavelengths. So it has more at the longer wavelengths. So what they do here is uh, they integrate the area under the curve um, over here, and then they compare it to a black body distribution that has the same area under the curve. This is how they determine um, effective temperatures for stars. So where does the end, the sun end? So the solar planes, you can see it, with the corona, chromosphere. Uh, all of that is part of the atmosphere of the sun. So this is the photosphere. It's actually what we see. So that is essentially so that is the effective uh, radius of the sun, even if it's continuous, even if it continues for how many millions of kilometers. So do you like the sun? You can be in the sun while you're still looking at the sun. Yeah. I mean, we are essentially, we are essentially in the sun because of the solar wind. Like, it's detected by the heat field. Yep, so. Cute. All right, yeah, that's, that's what I had uh, for you guys. So, any questions? Teams people. It's just about homework or anything else. No? I saw. What did you get? Too high. How many atoms uh, does the sun have? Can you estimate. Seven? Fifty-seven. This is about right. Yeah. We got three orders of magnitude more. I got something, I don't remember exactly the number, but it wasn't the right order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Yes. I thought the problem four, the second part, were happening at 10 degrees is supposed to be 90. Uh -huh. Would the, the amount of atmosphere in the cloud be different for the second part problem? The second part? Oh. Is it happening for the 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 at 10 degrees in the writing? Mm -hmm. 
Did I say 10 degrees or just a different But Well, that's 10 degrees of the Okay, I don't remember the lighting on. That's a bad memory. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so yeah, you have um, nine degrees and zero or ten. You have to go over the percentage of the structure in the room. Actually, get the S part of the ten thousand degrees. I think you're overthinking it a little. You have to go through zero. So. You have to calculate the optical depth. And the optical depth is in problem two, I think. Um, or one, or two. So you have kappa for blue and red light. Um, density, you can estimate it. I mean, I just said, you know, something that is uniform would be nicer to Assume that. Yeah, the M is constant as well. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's not a bad approximation if it's constant. Um, and so you can get that optical depth, and then you just use it in the e to the minus tau. Okay. So you can estimate the, the, the fraction of light that is not scattered by, by the atmosphere. Yeah, it's different for the two different, uh, the blue and, and red. And then Venus, because the atmosphere is so dense, uh, tau is going to be... Uh, I mean, don't do a part yet, actually. Yeah, so it's the same, it's just you know, different values. So the answer is that you could not see the sun if you were on Venus. Like we saw thick gems here that it would just well, look like a cube. Would you imply that if the thing is not molten, it's a complete impact on it? Uh, no, 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 because this is scattering. So it's not absorption. So you know, the, the photon is it travels in different directions. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you know, the moon is over there and the light is traveling directly at you. Each time that it interacts with a, uh, with a scatter, with a neutron, sorry, uh, nitrogen molecule it moves in a different direction. So it's not that the light disappears. It starts with Yeah, it's just that it's not in your direction anymore. So that's why you know, the sky is blue. It's like scattering. You know. so over there, when you look at them, you can watch the moon from here. But over there, it will not be able to be a hue. Um, this is like a proposal of how we can use the. No, but it's an easy problem. Yeah, it's, it's, we have to control it over the thing, honestly. <laughs> okay, more questions? No? All right.